the, the, the meditation today is a uh, I'm going to focus on Hamsa. And we'll come back to Hamsa as well at the end. So, just sit with me and imagine a beautiful little vortex right here above your head. Like a portal. It's actually the portal to the void. But remember that, you know, you know, like in the movies, when you get sucked into the black hole, you get through all these experiences and you see these tunnels and you go through all the things, right? So you can say that, well, okay, the goddesses, the angels, the beings, the ancestors are the, the visions that come in that suck when you get sucked into that vortex. They're the first things you're going to see. A, primarily because the intelligence behind everything wants to make it easy for you so that you don't freak out and die and panic and scream and shout because you're in entering the vast nothingness. And then it also gives you light, which is pulling you towards a light, a star of some kind. But only when you get near the star, do you realize that the star has a black hole in the middle of it and you're going through the black hole. And then when you go through the black hole, you're in the vast nothingness. And everything goes black, gray black. But you can feel and sense everything, but there is no, no more hallucination, no more vision, no more nothing. I, I can, I've had that experience maybe for a few seconds at a time because it's so immense and so overwhelming that something pulls you back into this world again, you know, at least the in-between world. So then you say, oh God, thank God I'm in the golden light again. Huh? <laughs> And so one of the, the teachings of, the, of very, very, very deep esoteric secret teachings of India is called the Brahmand teaching, which we'll talk about today. The Brahmand, in normal terms, Brahmand people think of the universe, is the name for the universe, the universe that I perceive or go beyond. The whole universe is Brahmand, right? But the Brahman we're talking about is this space between your third eye and your Sahasrara. This little bit here. The goddess is Meru. You know, if you think about it like a Meru, you've got your own Meru here, right? From the third eye, boom, 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 nine levels. This universe is the microcosm of the entire universe. But there's a hidden chakra there called the Bindu chakra that we will look at. So when you hear things like yoginis and you know, Dakinis and all these, these are the beings of this realm. They are not at Sahasrara, but they are not at Agya, in the in-between world. And what all the tantrics will tell you is that there's no way to go from Agya to Sahasrara. There's no wiring connecting it. So you're reliant on somebody reaching down and pulling you up. That means it's not possible. Now, some yoga practices and some Kali Krama practices claim to be able to break through and force it by force, right? Out the other roof of the head and then shoot yourself into the stars. Those so, are so rare that 
you know, their once in a lifetime creature will come along who can do that. They're not possible. If they do it, even we don't know because we won't know. How will we know that they did it? They come back and tell us, look, I went through, you know, they're not going to come back. <laughs> they're gone. <laughs> Normally, you find them dead outside a temple because they've gone off into another world and they can't come back. It's called Nirvikalpa Samadhi, right? That, that state of Brahma and explosion. But it's funny because the state required in Tantra, in Kundalini, before you have a Brahma and experience, is the state of Ardha Narishwara, which I'm talking about today. Right. So, just to let me show you a few things. One second. This is one of my favorite pictures of Ardhana Rishwara, of the half male, half female Chola. This is from Chola, of the Trishul. You know, there is the half male, half female carrying the gold, and the four hands, and there's Nandi the bull. You know, and it's actually the bull also becomes a cow. That's the funny part. Nandi becomes female too. Everything goes half-half. It's quite an amazing tra alchemical transmutation that occurs. So in India, this is a festival in the south of India that happens around every March in, called, in Kochi, which is a city in Kerala, where literally men dress up in every way possible, goddesses, transgender, Shiva Shakti, everything they can. And they take over the streets and they march through the streets. And it's a regular, and there are many, many groups. It's like a carnival in Rio. It is like a Rio carnival, but the, the celebration is transmutation, that you can be anything you like in this procession, no matter what it is that you believe or you think you are. Your identity dissolves and you become something else. This is a very powerful concept here, right? And this idea of a dual personality goes way back. You know, the, uh, these are three pieces of art here from three different periods. As early as the second century, we get Kushan, which is a northern empire that goes from China to India. And you see this half male, half female, androgynous being, right, as a, as a deity. And then in the Cholas, in the South India, you see this sixth century relief that shows Shiva and Shakti, these two, right. And this Brigi is a god, is a king who refused to go around Shiva because he had Shakti standing next to him. So just to prove a point, Shakti went and Parvati went and sat on his lap and the two bodies merged and he became Ardhanarishwara. And so Brigi had to choose to go around both of them as one. But then human arrogance, he refused to do that too and he became a beetle. And he dug his way into the, between the two of them and found a way to get to Shiva. So even though he is considered to be an Asuric energy, his devotion to Shiva was rewarded. <laughs> and Shakti forgave him for his arrogance. So he became a, a better devotee. You know? And then Nandi becomes female as a bull from bull to a cow. And then the Ajanta Caves, which is some of the most beautiful carvings you'll see in India, which is sort of middle of India to the near Bom nearer Bombay. You get these Ajanta Cave reliefs and you have Shiva temples there, you have statues there, you have an Ardha Narishwara, this form that we now know. So funnily enough, if you look at the early visualizations of Shiva and Shakti, right? You know, most people now think of Shiva sitting, looking like a six-pack Hercules on a mountain, meditating, right, with six-pack and, you know, muscles and everything. He had never looked like that. Never in the history of Indian iconography did he look like that until Bollywood came along. 
All right. Now, that's the problem is that Shiva was always androgynous. He would become male, he would become female, he could become anything he wanted to be. He was, he was consciousness. He could be in any form that was possible. So if you look at the early sculptures of Shiva, they're very delicate. He's like, you know, gentle, like a dancer posing. He's always posing gently, you know. When Shiva becomes this macho man, I have no idea. I have to do a study on that and find out the exact moment some artist somewhere decided that he's going to make him look like Charles Atlas or Superman. And that was it. Shiva became Superman. <laughs> but it was a, it was a very, um, there was never such an image for 2000 years. You know, there were two, three images of Shiva. Shiva was always seen as either the ash smitten ascetic who would carry a tr trishul and live in the cremation grounds and matted hair, or he would be the family man, again like that, but riding a bull with Parvati and Ganesh and Kartik, and that was their family, you know. Or he would be a linga, a stone, a round stone or a penis, right, like that. This image of the meditating Shiva comes much later. That all of you think of as Shiva is a new phenomenon. Maybe last hundred years. Yeah, you had pictures of meditating rishis, you know, bound up with their legs tied, sitting in meditation. But Shiva sitting, matted hair, snake, was a later development. And that's okay. That's all right. You know, we keep evolving our gods, don't we? The gods have to keep moving with the times, otherwise they die out and fade away. I mean, think of the thousands of gods that have vanished over the years, right? Whatever happened to them? You know, according to the, the mythologist and storyteller, Neil Gaiman, they're working in diners in America, you know. <laughs> so if you're there running bar somewhere, you know, they're, they're unemployed and they have to do something else. You know? <laughs> and uh, so the, the idea of an androgynous... So what this shows is that early Indian, um, early pre-Islamic India was much more accommodating for all kinds of interactions, sexual, physical, biological, than we can imagine. The statues of the 8th, 9th, 10th century show that all over India. From sexual poses to androgynous to homosexuality to animal bestiality. Everything was drawn and shown. That means it was in the popular psyche at some level. Another thing most people don't realize is that Indians did not start covering their bodies until the first century or so. That means... All through the epic periods of the Mahabharata and all the ancient pictures, women would go very lightly covered or not covered at all in breasts, you know, and uh, and men would only wear a slight cloth around their their body, like a tiny dhoti, you know. So sexuality that we think of it today with our Puritan ethics and our kind of dystopian idea of morality was not a phenomena that affected the psyche in the same way until about 1000 or so, 1200 AD, you know, until then in India, until the Islamic invasions began. Then the Islamic culture came with its rules of separating the women, sep clothing everybody, and it became a huge... In, in fact, one of the stories I was looking at was that the Indian sari that everybody loves was not known in India until the Romans started wearing Indian silks and shawls as, as, as togas, as saris. And the Indians copied that and said, oh, we should wear them too. Because they, had, they saw all these drawings of Romans wearing Indian silks as a sari. And by the first century, they started, the women started draping themselves with the sari. So you get the sari coming into you know, use. So the story of all the indications are not that it was a free-for-all debauched society. There was everything going on. There were monks, there were Buddhist monks, there were Brahmins, there were 
Jains, there were all kinds of people practicing all kinds of mysticism. It was a it was a country like any other country where, you know, think of how many Christian churches you have in America right now. 240 Christian actual church communities all doing their own thing. Right. Unitarians, Unitarian Universalists, Pentecostal. I mean, you name it, there are 240 of them now. Right. That's a lot of ways to talk to Jesus. Right. It's the same was in India. There was no coherent one religion that bound everybody together. You know, even today, most Indians will never agree on which God. If you go to their home, you will see one God. If you go to the temple, another God, and they'll, they'll, and they'll worship all of them. You know, and just to be sure, Indian homes will have 20, 30 gods just to protect you in case, you know, that if I don't have good luck from Lakshmi, then Kali will stop that and Durga will do this and Ganesh will do that and, and Hanuman will do this and, you know, have them all just in case. You never know. And every morning, Indian families go tuck, 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 touch them all and it's all good, right? That's the Anavapaya way that we talked about. So, when um, this comes along, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the idea of spanda, of union. That means inside you, the masculine and the feminine dance perpetually in the rhythm of the universe if you know how to dance in that rhythm, that pulse, that orgasmic pulse that the whole universe is a dance of. So this dance of Shiva Shakti, Radha Krishna, or this inside the same being is ultimate union. So one of the ways to look at it is that when human beings make love, it lasts for a certain amount of time, if you're lucky, and then it's over. That union, no matter how good a lover you are, is going to last for a few minutes to maybe an hour or two, if you're lucky, right? After that, union over. S separation, duality begins again, right? Now, the ideal image is one of continuous union in vibration, right? That means... That the universe is the endless love making of Shiva and Shakti, if you can think of consciousness and rhythmic dancing going on. The, the Spanda we talked about. And if you have, can't remember it, go watch the Spanda class, Spanda Karikas. It's like Gudum, Gudum, Gudum. The pulse going on and on and on. The dance, the dance, right? So very early on, the ancients saw that it was possible that an ideal condition would be that God of consciousness, meaning Shiva, the kind of detached, meditating, ash smoke, smoking, you know, ganja smoking, matted hair, outsider of society, and Shakti, the beautiful, radiant, golden mother with perfect beauty and, and continuity and giving life to everything and bringing it all into action, and movement and dance and beauty and sexuality, these two would have a perfect union of some kind. And that's what this image represented, was the perfect marriage of consciousness and energy, right? The spanda. 